Hello, and welcome to Community Voices, where we talk to Humboldt County's movers and shakers. Today's guest, Caroline Griffith, director of the North Coast Environmental Center. And now here's your host, Paul Versu. Welcome to Access Humboldt's Community Voices. I'm your host, Paul Bursu, and today we're with the newly elevated director of the North Coast Environmental Center, Caroline Griffith. Welcome. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Yeah, right on. So the first I always ask people what their job title is and, and what they do. So if, now that you're the newly elevated director, what does that mean for you? That's a, that's an excellent question. Um, well, I will say first of all that the um, it still entails my old job duties, which were eco news editor. So a large part of what I've been working on today actually is getting together our December issue of Eco News. Um, so not just writing about local environmental issues, but collecting um, reporting and stories from other folks locally who do that work. Uh, but as director, you know, a lot of that work is also advocacy work. Um, so actually monitoring um, different projects that are happening locally, whether that's development projects, projects, uh, and to really make sure that um, these are being done in the best possible way for people and the planet. Okay, so there's two words I'd like to uh, follow up on yeah. one at a time. One is editing, and that is how do you choose stories in which to cover? Wow, that is a really, um, that's an excellent question. And sometimes it seems like they kind of choose me because um, a lot of it really depends on what is happening locally. Um, you know, we have things that pop up like uh, offshore wind. For example, you know, that's one that has become obvious that we need to cover that story because we now have development potentially happening. Um, so a lot of the reporting work um, involves really just monitoring what's going on and waiting for the right moment to uh, report on it. And, and actually, we luckily have a lot of really fabulous um, contributors um, who come and pitch different stories that I then have the opportunity to, to choose whether or not we take those routes as well. Okay. So I'm gonna keep my other word on the back burner for a second, and yeah. I have a new word that I'm thinking of, space. Now you have stories that are long time ongoing stories, and then you just said events find you and they pop up. How do you have all the space to cover all the stories? Because I would imagine the long-term stories, you know, they exist and people wanna follow up on them. Absolutely. And we don't, we don't have the space to cover all of those in our, you know, we are a, um, well, we, we are a physical publication, which has a finite amount of space, which is 24 pages. Uh, but then we also luckily have this magical thing called the internet. And so we do have the opportunity to put longer stories um, on our website and to follow up with that. And, um, you know, it's an unfortunate part of, you know, tracking news stories like this is that not everything not everything becomes newsworthy. There are all these different little pieces of the puzzle that those of us who are more like policy wonks really love and know that those are important, but that's not necessarily newsworthy. So there's definitely a lot of writing that I do that doesn't necessarily make it out into the larger world. Um, it informs what does go out there. Um, but luckily, we don't actually have space for everything that I write because that would be pretty boring. Can something start out uh, seemingly newsworthy and then for whatever reason become not newsworthy? Not that it's not important, but become not newsworthy. Yeah, you know, that does happen, um, especially when, you know, there will be things that are happening, especially with like a development project that seem like they're going to be like a big flashpoint or a, a big scandal. And then um, the moment to really get that out there, there passes. And or it kind of like becomes a flashpoint and then that problem gets fixed because it is a flashpoint. You know, I will say one of the an example of that is the um, Nordic aqua farms um, that was very newsworthy for a little while that they were going to be approved 
without a full environmental impact report. Um, and that was like huge news and big scandal. Uh, but then because of public outcry, they decided to do a full environmental impact report. So that became slightly less newsworthy. Uh, and now we just have to wait and see what that report is to see if there's anything in that that will become a flashpoint. So there's the difficulty of, of choosing stories to cover. If you were to say, what are the issues right now that the NEC is working on most, uh, say three or four of the most critical issues, what would those be? Well, I think the, the biggest things that we have facing us right now on the North Coast, I mean, sea level rise and planning for sea level rise are huge. Um, and really to, to watch and see how that happens and make sure that we're doing it in a, um, like a sustainable manner. I think a lot of the sea level rise planning that's happening is very short term when we're really we're looking at big changes here on the North Coast. Uh, and kind of related to that also is a transition to renewable energy, um, watching the process of offshore wind uh, and how that development is going to happen is a priority for us because uh, there's so much involved with that. It's not just the um, placement of turbines out in the um, off the coast about 20 miles, but it's also the development of the ports, um, which would be where those turbines come out of. So that is another big, you know, project of the future that we are watching. Um, the drought is another issue and just water issues and water use issues. Um, we definitely hear a lot from folks concerned about industrial uses of water, particularly in the cannabis industry um, and working to kind of monitor that water usage. Uh, and along with that, I think the the dams, dam removal um, is another one that has been like, you know, there are a lot of issues that we've been watching for years and dam removal is one that we've been involved with for quite a while. Um, not just the Klamath dams, but the dams on the Eel River are ones that we really want to make sure come down. Okay, there's my second word I'm going to bring up now. You say public outcry and that's advocacy. Now, the, the NEC has been an advocate for environmental issues for 50 years. Do you have people coming to you wanting you to be the lead uh, in an advocacy uh, effort? Or do you have, um, well, I guess let's start there. I mean, do people come to you for that very reason? Um, they do. And, and oftentimes I think because we are a well-established organization that is pretty high profile, um, people will often come to us to seeking advocacy on certain issues that we luckily can direct them to other groups who are actually the ones who are doing a lot of work on those issues. So we do kind of act as a clearinghouse sometimes, um, which does you know, it, it makes it easier that we do have a lot of amazing environmental groups in the area. So, you know, if someone comes to us and they're like, man, we really need to do something about, you know, X, Y, and Z on the Bay, um, we can say, well, luckily, you know, we can direct you to our friends at Humboldt Baykeeper, and they are actually the ones who are the experts in this realm, um, which is great. Uh, but that is not to say that we don't constantly have people coming to us um, with specific issues and asking us to delve a, more into them. I'm sorry, is it a little more clout or a little more uh, cred if they come and say, NEC sent us? Yeah, you know, and that, that is a, that's a really good question. And I think that it does, we do have a lot of clout. And that's why I do feel um, honored to have been elevated to this position where, um, you know, people really do um, honor the work that we've done throughout the past. And we've had a lot of um, experts and carriers charismatic leaders who've like taken us into this, you know, five decades. So yeah, it is an honor. And but you know, it's I can be difficult because there's often a lot more information that needs to be gleaned. You know, when someone comes and says, I see this this issue happening, um, we have to make sure and like dig into what's actually happening in the root causes uh, before taking a stand on something. So I think that can be one of the, the challenges of uh, this work is not to just immediately react and say, yeah, we got to take that down. Um, you know, as we do have that clout, we also have a responsibility to make sure that, we're, um, that we have all the facts before we plow forward. Is that frustrating to some people at, at times because they want it now and you have to go ahead and do that uh, fact checking, let's say? Yeah, it can be 
pretty frustrating. Though, you know, I found as, as a person who gets to field a lot of those phone calls and emails, um, that folks just really want to be heard sometimes too. And so it is nice to be able to, you know, just commiserate with somebody about like, yeah, it, it really does suck that, you know, that, that, that logging is happening in your neighborhood and we can figure out if there actually is something we can do about it. Um, but mostly they just want to be heard. I understand that totally. I was a union advocate for 25 years for the California Teachers Association and, and hearing people is very important. But advocacy, I think advocacy is what goes ahead and connects people the most. If they see that you're active and they see that you can actually get things done, now, my question is, we were in a pandemic and we're at the end of a pandemic, or I hope we're at the end of a pandemic. And what has advocacy been like these last couple of years? You know, it has been strange. It's been a lot more, um, it's been a lot more like this, you know, people on a screen meeting to talk about what we need to do, a lot more writing, uh, but still those, um, the, the very basic advocacy, which are, um contacting the decision makers and arguing your case like we still can do that in in a pandemic a little bit harder to bring folks together to activate them in those ways um which that has definitely been a challenge and i think that we you know we all got pretty good at using these digital mediums to do that um and then i think that plateaued and now we're all a little tired of using these digital mediums to connect um so i i think that as we you know learn more we know more about public health we know more about how to keep ourselves healthy in crowds i think there are more opportunities to bring people together to um have educate them and also to activate as well. And, you know, I think that we're going to see that hopefully um, with, you know, we have some current fights going on with coalition partners about the potential coal train here in Humboldt County. Um, and I think that there's, there's definitely a lot of desire to bring people actually physically together and, and discuss this issue and activate them. Well, pre-pandemic, you had something called Activate NEC. That was a, a bi-monthly meeting where you brought people together to, and was that to air their issues or to kind of create strategies for advocacy? You know, it was really to, the goal was to create strategies for advocacy, to come together, to talk about some of the issues. You know, and we always have like a pretty, you know, if right now someone were to get in touch with me and say, what are three things that I could do right now? Um, you know, I would have those things, whether it's to, to write a letter to a certain elected official about an issue, um, to sign a petition, to boycott a certain company, you know, we'd always have like these stock, like here are some things to do. Um, so we have those ready for folks, but th the goal is really to kind of collectively talk about the issues in the community and strategize around them because uh, personally that's something that i find really important is that um the engagement that we you know we're all especially when it comes to environmental issues you know we are all affected by them however uh, it tends to fall to the experts to really decide how we address them and i think in terms of you know activism in general um, whether it's environmental electoral social justice you know we all have the ability to be experts, we just really need to learn those skills. And so that was the, you know, really the goal of Activate, which, you know, we're, we're hoping to really reboot that um, when we can come together in person. Is it possible to engage people or has it been possible? I mean, now you're looking back at this uh, through the Zoom meetings and, the, and, and that sort of platform as opposed to having people actually in the room where there can be some some energy and people get fired up yeah you know i think that it has been easier for people to like dip their toes into certain things in this digital realm right because you can hear about uh you know a webinar about a certain issue and be like oh i can watch this while i'm making dinner uh, but i think that there so you can learn a little bit about things and kind of get some surface level involvement but i think you're absolutely right like that um there is a need for us to be able to come together and get fired up and strategize about things that that i don't know is really i have not seen it be really successful in the digital realm and there's a need you know we are human animals right and there's there's a lot that we communicate to each other 
that isn't just through our voices. Um, and so, or even just, you know, our, our body language, like there's just a lot that is communicated when we are actually physically together. Um, but I think especially when we're talking about environmental issues, I think that is very important because we are, we are the environment. 50 years of the NEC, all of that, uh, you know, the legitimacy, the credential, the name, and then environmental issues didn't go away. Have you felt in the last couple of years it, as a, uh, you know, as an organization that you've been increasing the interest, increasing the membership, or has it been harder? You know, I think that we have been kind of shifting the membership, you know, and really working to bring in younger people. Um, that is an ongoing process. I think that it has been, that has been kind of difficult. Um, you know, I, we have a pretty big archive of old eco news, like from the early seventies. Right. Uh, and I just, you now when I'm bored, go look through them. And it has been shocking how many of the same issues we are still working on, you know, and to think about like, these are really like long-term campaigns. Uh, and I think that that can be um, that can be hard to get younger people involved in things like that, you know, and to, to really see that. And that's something that we're really our challenge right now is to to fight the apathy because you can see that it, it's hard to convince somebody to engage in these struggles when they have been not entirely successful over the last 50 years. You know, we've made headway and I think a lot of the games that we have are because people worked really hard and I, it would be, we'd be in a much different world now if folks had not been doing this work over the last 50 years. Um, but there's still a huge amount of work to be done. And in order to do that, we need to, we need to shift the demographic of folks who are involved. Now, the NEC used to run programs. I would imagine that got people interested have you been able to run programs or are you starting to run programs to uh, get people involved now that the pandemic is lifting somewhat? You know, we're, we're dreaming about that. We're kind of in a, um, we're gonna take the winter months to do a little um, visioning about what that's gonna be and see what we can roll out in the new year. Uh, because that is very important to, to staff, definitely. And as we kind of, like I said, we're, we're in a transition, we're kind of, I don't want to use the exact same words that my predecessor and advisor, Larry Glass, used recently, um, but I'm going to because it was great, um, that we're transitioning from the old dinosaurs into the into the newer generation, you know, that, that we have a, um, it's been an older generation that has been run, directing this movement, um, especially the, this organization. And so we're taking the next couple of months to, to what the newer generation um, can bring forward. So I would say stay tuned in 2022 well, to see I mean, what the NEC brings out. Keeping the institutional knowledge of the, the dinosaur uh, set, which, you know, I can relate to, and then going ahead <laughs> and getting new energy involved. Any, any uh, give me some previews and maybe some programs you're thinking of for this next year. Um, well, one thing that we are really scheming and dreaming about is a uh, longer kind of um, longer duration workshops for activists. So to really kind of jumpstart that engagement and get the to, to take that institutional knowledge that folks have who've been in this movement forever uh, and work to train the younger generation through different workshops about like how to plan an environmental justice campaign and actually going through like setting your goals and figuring out what your tactics would be for that uh, to, to really train up the next generation of environmental advocates. That would require or would that require it would be better bringing people to the NEC and working with them directly, or could that be done online? When we've envisioned it, we've kind of envisioned a hybrid model. Like ideally we would love to have people together in a room, but we recognize that that's not always feasible. And then also you can get a larger, you know, we have, there are folks out in the, the hinterlands who wouldn't necessarily be able to drive into the NEC office in Arcata once a week who would be able to, you know, tune in and do something virtually 
So we're, we're exploring both options. Just really, we the goal is accessibility and to make sure that we can actually, you know, get get folks engaged in this movement and prepared to do the work. Is that the number one project right now? That transition that you're talking about from the dinosaurs to the <laughs> younger, well, the, the mammals or the what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that metaphor wasn't really like fully fleshed out, right? Because we needed to have whatever the, the second thing was. But um, yeah, that is the big, that is the big, um, plan right now. The biggest thing we've got in the works is that transition. And so when you have a structural, or maybe you've never had a structural transition like this, this is a fascinating to me. The issues, the environmental issues continue to happen. So things are going to pop up, right? And, yeah. you know, Ms. Director, uh, how do you go ahead and juggle or prepare for that workload of what's going on? <laughs> excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, I think that it's kind of helpful in that these are kind of immediate sort of things, right? So it really is, you know, there's a certain level of just reacting and putting out fires. Um, so what I like to do is devote different parts of the day to different things, right? And so maybe the mornings, the mornings are for planning for the future. The afternoons are for reacting to the present and uh -huh. just keep moving forward. But, you know, I'll, honestly, like I'm super, very, very fortunate, um, to be a part of an organization where we do have a lot of that institutional knowledge and people who are very willing to and have been many of them for decades volunteering their time to this movement um and so and then also dedicated staff who are very involved as well and so um it's important for me to always remember to that there are people i can rely on right to ask for help and i think that like in in movements in general we always have to remember that right that we're not alone um, thank you for being on. I, I got a note here from the research department. You've been voted best haircut ever on the show. So congratulations <laughs> for that as well. Yes. <laughs> and that's about all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank my guest, uh, Caroline Griffith, and wish you good luck in your new elevated uh, position uh, at the North Coast Environmental Center. And so thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Community Voices. This has been Community Voices with your host, Paul Rousseau. If you represent a nonprofit organization and are interested in being a guest on Community Voices, send an email to info at accesshumble.net or call 476-1798. Axis Humboldt, local voices through community media.